This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by five amazing people. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Bart Ooms, 36 Dingo, and Michael Fritzke. If you want to become a patron, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have back with me Travis Watson. Yes, you do. I do. Also known as W.T. Watson. Yes. I always tell people that because that's how I write my books. I have the pseudonym so I can be mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no relation to Travis Walton, even though your no. initials are the same. Yes. No, I, I do not have any relation to Travis <laughs> Walton. I have never... <laughs> Never witnessed the the closest that I can say that I've come to Travis Walton is I used to live in Arizona. Okay, uh, right. but that was that was many moons ago, and uh, I I never, to my knowledge, been abducted by aliens. So. Okay, to your knowledge, <laughs> to my knowledge, yeah. You know, I'm not saying that, that these things are impossible, but uh, I don't. If if it happened, they did a really good job memory wise. <laughs> All right, so your your latest book here is Sasquatch Canada, and we did part one last week on this, and uh, we ran out of time because it's an awesome book, and there's way too much stuff I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, there are a lot of stories in the book too. Yeah, I mean, I I just as a as a brief recap for people who might be might be listening to things out of order, I I uh, decided when I was doing Canadian Monsters and Mysteries that I wasn't going to be able to include Sasquatch in the book, or it was going to be like four feet thick. Um, and one of the things that, as I began doing research for this book, one of the things that I, I noticed was that a lot of people that write about Sasquatch tended to focus in British Columbia. So I wanted to see if there were Sasquatch stories in the rest of Canada. And there were. There yeah. were quite a lot. Um, I found Sasquatch stories in every province in Canada except none of it. So, um, and that's that's where where we are. We, we talked extensively about some other stories that uh, you'll have to, to visit episode one for. Yes. Um, but uh, we're going to go on and, and talk about some more interesting things tonight. Yeah, this next one comes from the Sasquatch Chronicles blog, and it's the old Panawa Dam. Yeah. So, and I'm trying to remember what province I'm in. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, let me see. see. I'm scrolling back. It's the same one as Carrie's story. Uh, Manitoba. Okay. Uh, so, I had, uh, so we talked in the last story, uh, in the last episode, we ended the last episode with a, a feel good story about Sasquatch. This one's kind of scary because um, it, it almost seems as though the witness um, contacted, came into contact with some creatures that were not particularly happy about her being there and uh, were actually trying to creep up on her. Um, so just a little, little backstory is that this witness who chose to be anonymous, um, was in the midst of, uh, of being estranged from their spouse. Um, this person was very familiar with the local wildlife, uh, which is something I always like to stress when I, when I do these stories, because everybody's, you know, everybody's first response is, oh, well, they saw a bear. Right. It's like, no, they didn't see a bear. People who know the local wildlife know what a bear looks like. Um, this particular witness was trained as a veterinary technician um, had a, and had worked for a government veterinarian in the area uh, before she got married. And uh, later on, ended up doing wildlife rehabilitation for the Department of Natural Resources in Canada. So this person was very, very familiar with her local lot wildlife and had probably raised some of it. Um, so during this stressful time when she was still living in the house with the spouse that was, that, that she was leaving, um, she would go for long walks in the morning to just kind of clear her head. Right. Um, and this area of Panama sits right on the edge of, uh, you know, a pretty large world, like a lot of Canada sits right on the edge of a pretty large wilderness area. Um, she says it's surrounded on three sides by the municipality of Oakland. And on the fourth side, there's about 13 square kilometers of crown land. 
uh, which is how they, they talk about public land up here in Canada. Um, we still have, you know, uh, well, it was Queen Elizabeth, not Queen Elizabeth anymore, but we still have, you know, pictures of the Queen and stuff around here. There's there's much more uh, kind of uh, British stuff up here since uh, we never, uh, Canada never, uh, you know, did the whole War of Independence thing. They just waited the Brits out until they finally <laughs> gave them their independence. Um, maybe why Canadians seem to be a little more patient, but <laughs> right. So it's May, 2007. Um, witness was going out for an early morning walk on a, on a trail. Uh, weather was frosty, it was, but the, it was cold, but, uh, the snow had, had pretty much melted off. Um, she is walking down a, a path that, uh, it has a lake on one side and a river channel from a man-made dam on the other side. So just kind of walking on a, a causeway, I guess you could call it. Uh, but it wasn't for vehicles. It was strictly for, for walking. So on the right side of her was a lake. On the left side of her was a river. And then there's a, a granite wall uh, that, that goes off to the side as part of the, the dam. So she's walking, and again, like I said, very familiar with the local wildlife. The first weird thing she notices is that she finds these two garter snakes in the middle of the the, uh, the causeway, and they've both been crushed. Uh, one of them's dead already, and one of them was pretty badly twisted up. This is an area that the local kids would come to to basically play with the snakes when they were out and about. But the weird thing about it was that this was too early in the season for snakes to be out. Um, snakes hibernate uh, in, in the wintertime like bears and stuff because it's just too cold for them to be out. Um, so it was strange that the snakes were out at all. Yeah. And then the other weird thing is that, and, and this, you know, gives you, you know, cattle mutilation vibes. The snakes hadn't been scavenged at all. Now we have crows up here. I, I, I know you have crows in, in, in Western New York too. Yeah. We have crows up here. If it's dead, there are crows everywhere, right? These guys, for some reason, weren't even attracting crows. So the witness stopped long enough to take the live snake and put it off to the side of the path. And as she was doing that, she looked out and uh, about 60 meters, which is approximately 200 feet to her right, she saw an animal out in the lake. And at first she thought it was a bear. And yeah, this cracked me up. The bear was actually, this bear, quote unquote, was, was defecating into the lake. Um, you know, so this gives new, new terminology to that whole bear crapping in the woods. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I saw that and it was the first thing that jumped into my head because, hey, my father used that exp- expression all the time. Um, he had a number of, of Southernisms that uh, crack you up. Um, so as the witness is looking at this bear, <laughs> alleged bear, um, of course, being aware of the local wildlife, she starts scanning the shoreline looking for cubs because you don't want to get it between a bear and its cubs, right? right? That's just one of those things you don't want to do. And all of a sudden, this bear that had been taking a dump in the lake stands up and she realizes that she's looking at something over eight feet tall that's definitely not a bear. Um, it turned and is is very characteristic with Sasquatch. It didn't turn its head. It turned its entire body. And it stood kind of side on to her um, before coming out of the water in a very fluid motion. So this creature apparently saw her and moved off toward the tree line. And she described the movement as, as it looking like it was on skates. Uh, this is something that you see all the time in, in, in Sasquatch accounts is that that whole idea that uh, they move very, very smoothly. And it's one of the things that uh, distinguishes the Sasquatch from a bear, for instance. You know, if you've ever seen a bear like in the circus or whatever up on its hind legs, uh, that walk is not smooth. You know, they waddle when they're on their hind legs. It's not natural to them. Whereas the Sasquatch apparently is very uh, adept at, at bipedal locomotion and is so adept that it, it really gives a lot of witnesses that impression that it's, it's you know, I, I've seen people describe it as it looked like it was on a skateboard or it looked like it was on cross-country skis or this, this woman said skates. Um, it very much, uh, you know, it, it gave her the very distinct impression of moving very smoothly. Yeah. And then as it got into the, to the woods, it of course vocalizes, makes this big gruff sound. Um, and she noted that it was, it was showing her teeth and kind of this ro- low rumbling vocalization. So, you know, she describes this thing as having, uh, you know, dark eyes. Uh, the mouth was huge. Uh, like I said, it had shown her teeth. It was making kind of a grimacing face, which, 
uh, in in Great Apes, if I remember correctly from from Jeff Meldrum's book, uh, you know, represents either uh, aggression or fear. Um, either one, you know, when you're talking about an eight foot tall creature that weighs several hundred pounds, either one of them is probably a good thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's there's movement in the bush uh, about ten meters beyond where this particular Sasquatch was standing, and the witness sees another one of these creatures come out of the trees. Um, at this point, the witness decided that hey, maybe she should get the heck out of there, um, and she starts to she's reluctant to turn her back on these creatures, um, and so she starts backing away um, down this causeway, coming backing back in the direction that she came from. Uh, interesting thing is she reported that her pulse was pounding in her ears. She felt dizzy and nauseous, which is, you know, she was having a very physical reaction to these creatures, something else that's very common. Um, the, the flesh and blood researchers like to say that it's, uh, that it's ultrasound, right. which, you know, the creature had been vocalizing. That's entirely possible. We know that tigers do it. Um, you know, we know that, that some of the great apes do it, uh, if I remember correctly. But yeah, I believe in, so. Anyway, she's she's having that strong reaction that a lot of people have, um, and she's still backing slowly away from this thing, even though she's almost paralyzed with fear. Um, and then it roars. <laughs> now, everybody who's experienced a, a, an up close and personal Sasquatch vocalization like this, you know, has a little bit different description of it. Um, but she described it as being similar to the roar of a lion. Um, you could actually feel it made, she said it made your insides uh, shake. Um, and so of course she goes, she's already terrified. This thing roars at her. And then as she is, you know, contemplating her, her reality in that moment, she hears a clatter of rocks off to the side of her and she stops and realizes that there's another one of these creatures that is climbing its way up the embankment of this causeway. Uh, you know, with what intent, we really don't know. Yeah. But she's close enough to this thing to where when she sees its hand come up over the, uh, over the edge, she can see the fingernails and the dirt and debris and the knuckles were deformed and large. And, you know, she felt like this particular creature had arthritic or swollen knuckle joints on, you know, this gigantic hand, right? Yeah, which is a really interesting so, detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was very interesting. You know, if you have, you know, if you follow the flesh and blood idea, then, you know, these creatures have to get old eventually, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are, are instances of people seeing Sasquatch that have like gray hair, you know, surrounding their faces and stuff. Um, so some of them seem to give the impression that they've gotten older. In any event, she tur she looks at this thing. Um, you know, she realizes that it's coming up on the side of her. She's got two in front of her. She's like, I think I'd better just get the hell out of here. Um, so she had made enough progress, you know, so that she was past the creature that was sneaking up on her. So basically she turns and runs, uh, which probably isn't the best thing to do with a, a predator, but you know, I, I can't say that I blame her in that particular circumstance. I mean, you're, you're, you're definitely outgunned in that circumstance. It's like, you've got three creatures, all of whom weigh more than a human being does. And, you know, you have one lone female, she turned and sprinted down the road about 200 meters and you know, made it that far before she became violently ill uh, at the side of the road. She managed to stumble the half a kilometer back to her house. You know, the divorce became final not too long after that. She moved to Winnipeg and she only returned to that area once that summer. And she stayed away from the forest <laughs> completely. I, f I find um, it really interesting that it happened during a divorce. Mm -hmm. You know, it has that liminal... It all sense to it. Yeah. So you have the people, that this person, and she's walking on a causeway. So she, yeah, yeah. She's like between two bodies of water. She's not in either one. She's between two bodies of water. So you have that very liminal kind of, 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 of uh, idea. And you have the very clear indication here. Uh, again, like you said, you've got the whole divorce uh, bit of it happening. You have a clear, very clear indication here, though, that these particular creatures were not enthralled to see her there. And this whole detail of the one sneaking up the, the side of the causeway at her, you know, gives you some pause about, you know, what were their intentions? 
Yeah. We know that the native people have stories of Sasquatch, you know, t- taking particularly females, females, children uh, from yeah. the tribe. Um, you know, what they do with them, who knows? Um, but, uh, you know, not a, not something that we want to sit and think about a whole lot. Uh, but, you know, it just goes to, to show you that if you do encounter one of these creatures, it's not always Pollyanna, you know, general general guardian of the forest stuff it kind of i think depends on who you encounter yeah you know, I, I think these creatures have personalities you know and some of them are grumpier than others yeah yeah well true and you don't want to get crosswise with one of the grumpy ones not all i'm going to say about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh I, and i wonder like okay if, if we're dealing with something that's not flesh and blood because she is someone who deals with animals she probably takes a closer look at this thing than someone who's not as familiar with animals, which is why she may have exactly, noticed the yeah. swollen knuckles and stuff, which if you go with a co-creation theory, did she notice that because she sort of helped create that in such detail? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, so if, you know, if we go with the idea that Sasquatch is a thought form of some kind, then, you know, that we, for whatever reason, have have created to a point where it's able to, to physically manifest itself then why would, you know, little details like that get added in? Right. And the answer is, you know, because those things happen to us. We assume we have this tendency to anthropomorphize things, mm-hmm. right? And so we assume that a an upright bipedal creature is going to be kind of like us. So it's going to get older. It's going to have arthritis in its hands. It's going to get a crippled foot, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you can see where uh, the thought form theory really kind of makes some good sense there. Um, you know, and the other possibility is that, yes, these are some of there are some flesh and blood creatures that live out in the forest in Canada and other places and they get old, too. Um, yeah. Either way, it's fascinating that, you know, that she noticed that particular detail. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's just it adds to the mystery, you know, which is the fun part of doing all this stuff. As far as I'm concerned, it's like, I, I don't, I don't think we're ever really going to be able to just, Oh yes. Well, you know, Sasquatch is a uh, fill in the blank. Right. Yeah. Um, well, even if we find a flesh and blood Bigfoot, that doesn't explain yeah. all the other weirder encounters that clearly were not flesh and blood. Exactly. Other than you know, so, paranormal phenomena tends to mimic real things sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I was just about to say, you know, the possibility is that you have a, an entity, you know, part of that that vast ecology of spirit that or soul that uh, Joshua likes to talk about. Mm-hmm. We have an entity that has assumed this particular form because, you know, there's a, a family or clans or whatever of, of these things living in the forest. And so it says, hey, that would be a great form to be in. People will be scared of me and I can run around and scare people and, <laughs> and you know, collect energy and stuff, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so <laughs> that's a third possibility. You know, I yeah. mean, yeah. It, you know, because if you have an, an entity like this that is assuming a form, then, you know, why not make it gnarly, right? Oh, look at my gnarly hands and fingers and stuff. Isn't that gross? You know, I mean. Because a lot of times it seems like these things are, are these manifestations are designed to scare the crap out of people, <laughs> you know. And what better way to do that than reflect back the uh, the aging process on a human being, particularly a human being who's already in emotional distress, right? Yeah. So, and that's the thing, you know. She got violently ill. Did she get violently ill because of the stress, the fear, or was she exposed to energy or infrasound or something like that? That enhance that yeah exactly mm-hmm. you know I, I mean i've known people who've gotten violently ill because of encounters with um we'll call them spirits um that didn't vibrate with the same kind of resonance that human beings do um i call them disharmonic entities because that's kind of the best way to think of them it's 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 not necessarily necessarily that they're even hostile they just don't their vibrational rate and our vibrational rate don't mesh yeah. and it produces a very strong physical effect in some people. Um, so, you know, that could have been what was happening there too. You know, this particular, yep. if this particular creature was a thought form or uh, an entity, another world entity, then, you know, it may just be that that energy didn't mesh with her energy well and, you know, caused yeah. her to lose her cookies. Yeah, absolutely. It, it happens. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's, there's all we could really do is guess about it. Yeah, 
you know, I mean, we weren't there. Yeah. I mean, exactly. it could just be that the thing smelled so bad it made her sick. <laughs> I, you know, she doesn't mention that, but that could be, you know, because I, I, I've also read encounters where people talked about how the smell was just absolutely nauseating. Yeah. And, uh, you know, <sighs> So the one of the things you also talk about in this book a lot is how many more encounters would we hear about if there wasn't this fear of ridicule? Oh, God. Yeah. You know, and, and this goes with all paranormal witnesses, not just Sasquatch, but anybody who's seen anything out of the ordinary, right? Uh, I love, you know, things like uh, the Alberta Sasquatch Organization websites and the BFRO and, you know, mon- uh, Phantoms and Monsters and things like that, where people can actually tell their story to people who are interested in the stuff and aren't going to make fun of them. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure there are UFO sites like that too. I don't, sure. I, I don't, can't think of one right off my head, but or off the top of my head. But, um, you know, it's, if you read this book, you will encounter people who didn't tell their story for over 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows what because, details were lost in that time. Yeah. Too. It's just one particular one that sticks out in my mind is a native fellow who, um, who encountered a Sasquatch and it, when he was younger. And um, he finally told his story uh, after seeing a, a, a television news thing that was kind of like, oh, Sasquatch, ha, 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 you know, uh, doing the whole, you know, uh, X-Files theme in the background and the, the yeah, whole ridicule yeah. thing, right? He says, those creatures exist. I know they do because I saw one. And then he pulls out a – the thing made such an impression on him that he pulls out a freaking scrapbook of, you know, like sketches and, and things that he had made of this creature uh, when when this 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 uh, event happened. You know, I mean – the thing that that people who haven't had these experiences fail to realize, and I, I know that I, I beat this dead horse all the time, but you know the the thing that people fail to realize, <coughs> excuse me, is how profoundly some of these sightings affect people. Yeah, yeah, you know, I've said it before. You know, a lot of times having a you know fill in the blank kind of encounter, whether it's Sasquatch, UFOs, ghosts, you know, whatever can be a life-changing experience. Yeah. And the last thing you need is to have some doofus look at you and laugh and say, ah, oh, you saw a bear. Right, right. Like, I mean, I would be inclined to hit somebody in the head. You know? <laughs> um, you know, it's like if I saw a Sasquatch, you know, I, I'm very familiar with, with wilderness and wildlife. You know, I, I've, I've been around a time or two myself. I've spent some time in the woods. I know what a bear looks like. Right. Yeah. You know, and I know how a bear moves. Um, I'm not going to mistake a bear for a Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure that there are sightings, you know, some of these momentary roadside sightings or stuff that, you know, it was a bear with its paw on a tree or something. Yeah. But yeah. when you have, you know, sightings where somebody stood and watched a creature or watched it through a rifle scope or whatever for a period of time, um, you know, to, to, to just, you know, scoff and say, oh, well, you just saw a bear is, is just your way of, of just denigrating somebody. And it's just, it's that, that kind of treatment that makes people clam up about their stories and not tell them. Right. Uh, and so I just, I, you know, I just want to say to people, you know, if you know somebody who's had an encounter, you know, even if you think they're completely full of it, yeah. please don't, yeah. you know, don't, don't well, mess with them about it. You know? <laughs> My, my, I mean, my policy is always to believe somebody unless there is such a blatant red flag. Oh, yeah. And even then, I'll probably just let it go and just be like, okay, yep. Because, I, you know, believing someone who's lying is not really hurting anything. But yeah, not, believing, really, not believing no, someone who's telling the truth is is exactly what you just described. It's 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 potentially harming them. Yeah, it's it's traumatic in its own way, you know. And, and you know. Let's face it. We don't really know what another person's reality is. Yeah. I've talked to some very, very interesting people who are nutty as fruitcakes, but, you know, they could pull out notebooks full of things to expl- and explain to you in, in graphic detail how to time travel. Right. I mean, with, we're, you know, we're, with circles and arrows and pictures and diagrams and mathematical equations and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what their reality is. Yeah. You know, that may be something real to them. <laughs> You know, 
And who am I to say? You know, I, I mean, I'm fairly sure the person I was talking to was was a classic schizophrenic, but I'd only ever met them that one time. Yeah, yeah. They, they walked into a store that I was working in and uh, started laying all this stuff on the counter and telling me about it. And who knows? It yeah. could have been for real. <laughs> right, know? right. I have no idea. One of the great mysteries, right? I, uh, and the thing is, with with some of this high strangeness stuff, some of it's so weird, you know? <laughs> and, and having had enough experiences personally, like, I know just how weird it can be. And there are people who have had weirder experiences than I have. And those are the people who are going to get dismissed. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's like, oh, that's just ridiculous. And they don't want to tell it. Or they'll, they'll leave out the stuff they think is too weird. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, yeah, I saw Bigfoot. I mean, yeah, there are all these lights around him, too, but I'm not going to tell you that mm-hmm. part. Yeah, he was holding a glowing orb for his chest. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, and you're right. People self censor. Yeah. You know, we do this all the time. You know, we tell people what we think they want to hear. And, you know, paranormal witnesses are, aren't any different from that. You know, yeah. they'll tell you what you want to hear. So if you're a UFO investigator, they'll tell you about the UFO they saw, but they'll neglect to tell you about the Sasquatch that jumped out of the bottom of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, or the fact that their house has been plagued by poltergeist phenomena since they saw this thing. Yeah. 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 Or, you know, the, the two calves that they lost to mutilation, you know, three weeks later, I, you know, yeah. that stuff doesn't come up because you want to hear about the nuts and bolts UFO, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, uh, I just, we need to open our minds, yeah. you know, uh, is, is what it boils down to is we need to open our minds and we need to accept that there are stuff going on out there that we're just like, we don't have any idea. Yeah. <laughs> What's really happening Um, other than that there are some very acute perceptual things going on with human beings that are taking extremely bizarre and strange forms. And what those are, you know, remains to be seen. The, I think the, the popularity of some of these TV shows is a good thing. Like even if the shows themselves aren't necessarily all that good, uh, the fact that finding Bigfoot and, and all these other shows and even ancient aliens and stuff it makes people a little more comfortable talking about this stuff. Granted, it's sure. within certain normalized confines of the phenomena, but still, it takes it a little bit less out of the, a little more out of the ridicule factor. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'll be the first to admit, I loved finding Bigfoot. You know? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it yeah. was too much fun. I enjoyed watching them go out there and do crazy stuff in the wilderness trying to, attra- to attract the Sasquatch's attention. I thought it was fun. I loved, you know, the town halls where people would get up and tell these stories about, you know, I mean, I saw this thing and it was, you know, it was one of and they'd go out and investigate into all this. I love that stuff. I thought it was great. You know, I mean, I don't agree with, you know, their, their whole flesh and blood, you know, and this is an entirely flesh and blood, you know, mystical ape that's running around in the woods or whatever. Right. But, you know, I, I don't agree that, but that doesn't mean I can't enjoy the show. I enjoyed sure. it a great deal. Uh, I found it very entertaining. Um, you know, in some of the ghost shows too. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, yeah, I, have yeah. tr- I have trouble getting that stuff up here in Canada because, uh, you know, like travel channel and stuff, I'd have to get a VPN and VPN into the United States <laughs> to actually be able to subscribe. <laughs> so, I don't get to see as much of that stuff as I'd like, but, um, you know, I mean, it's so, uh, it's good that people are talking about these things, yes. even if it isn't a very limited thing, because it makes the person who's had the experience go, well, maybe I'm not nuts. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I did see a giant owl out in the woods, <laughs> you know, or, you know, some skinny white, you know, rake thing or, you know, whatever it happened to be. Right. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Or Sasquatch or you know, whatever. So, uh, dog me. <laughs> so I think the next story we had was, uh, from the Albert, Albert, uh, Alberta Sasquatch organization website. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I love this story. Um, cause I grew up, um, well, I didn't grow up, but I spent uh, ooh, two years, I guess, on a special forces base in Panama when I was a kid. Uh, my mother was actually married to a Green Beret at one point. And, um, you know, so I, I, I kind of put myself into the mindset of the individual who's telling the story, who's a special forces person here in Canada. Uh, I think they call it Joint Task Force up here. Um, so this story actually has two parts. Uh, we're talking in the uh, the Alberta section of the book. I talk about uh, this individual um, again, special forces person. He's out on um, uh, you know he's out on a training mission. Um, he's with another guy, and um, they're driving their camouflage pickup truck, and 
His other uh, skill in the military is electronic repair. So they're uh, going to look for, uh, this is in the 80s, right? They're going to look for this piece of equipment that needs to be repaired. Um, and of course, they've got a map and they've got a set of coordinates and they have to do the whole orienteering thing and find this thing, right? Yeah. It's the 80s. It's well before GPS happened. So they, uh, you know, they're, they're driving along a forest road. I think it was a logging road or something like that. Um, they stopped to get their bearings and his partners got the maps, you know, out on the truck and he's doing the compass thing. He's doing all this stuff and he's kind of standing there waiting for him to figure out where the heck they're going. He's looking off at uh, a break in the, in the trees, uh, 40 or 50 yards away and being a hunter, he spots a deer. It's like, Oh deer, Hey, look, check it out. So he's looking at the deer and as he's watching, he sees a Sasquatch break cover on on all fours, move on this deer, grab the thing, snap its neck, throw it over its shoulder, and then disappear back into the forest in less time than it took him to turn to his friend and say, hey, look at that. <laughs> you know, he described it, the, the swiftness of the movement as being like cheetahs that he had seen hunting in the African belt. You know, it, it was that fast, which when you think about it, a creature that big should be able to move that fast. Right? Yeah, yeah. But that, that was the way that, that he saw it. So so this guy, who is a special operator in the Canadian forces, has a Sasquatch experience up in Alberta on a training mission. Um, later on, um, he's doing a similar thing in northern Ontario in a place called, <laughs> I love this name, Petawawa. Um, Petawawa. Uh, again, they're doing a, uh, a training course. Uh, they're doing winter survival training. So they're out uh, in Algonquin Provincial, about two or three kilometers from Algonquin Provincial Park, which is a massive wilderness area here in, um, uh, in, in Ontario, I guess kind of central Ontario. It's about three or four hours north of Toronto, just to give your, your listeners an idea. Okay. Um, place I want to go visit because there's been significant Sasquatch area, uh, Sasquatch activity in that area. Um, and several reports up there. So they're doing winter survival training. So, of course, they're there in the winter, and it's minus 30 Celsius, which is about uh, minus 22 Fahrenheit. Wind's blowing like crazy. Um, this fella's uh, doing his stint on guard duty. Um, the, the idea is that you have someone who's constantly watching the camp to yeah, you know, it's kind of like a fire watch. Um, okay. To make sure that the uh, you know that the equipment and, and 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 people stay safe in the night, right? You know, if you were com- if you were in a combat area, of course, you know, you'd have more than one person posted. But for stuff like this, they would post one person right. who would walk a tour around the camp. Um, and, uh, so this was one of the few encounters that I included that didn't have an actual visual sighting in it. Um, and I included it kind of for the sake of, of, of completeness, because I talked about the, the whole deer snatching incident in the Alberta section. So when I got to the Ontario section, I really had to, um, uh, I really felt that I needed to include this one. Now, a little background on this soldier. This guy is not just a special operator. He is also a, a very experienced hunter who's been hunting the woods of Canada since he was a kid, right? So he's, again, one of those people who's very familiar with the local wildlife. He's walking his, his, uh, his fire watch, his, his uh, security duty, um, says, you know, he notes that they were in bear country. Most of the bears up there are black bears, though. They, didn't, they don't have the real big brown bears in, in Ontario like they do in, in uh, like British Columbia and places like that. But, you know, there's plenty of other critters in the area. They had fishers, they had wolf, they had coyote, the whole, whole, whole thing, right? He's walking along uh, around his encampment, and he hears talking <laughs> down the mountainside, just inside the tree line, um, off of, uh, you know, he says off of a rocky protuberance about a third of the way down the slope. He can hear a voice speaking, but he can't, like, he can't parse out words. Right. right? It's about 150 or 200 meters away by his reckoning. He said the voices sounded Japanese, uh, like in the samurai movies, pretty much the same. So immediately, anybody who's who's a, a, a Sasquatch aficionado clicks on the samurai chatter from the Sierra Sounds, right? But uh, I'm not sure when those were recorded, but it probably was about the same time. Um, he's like really puzzled by this because there shouldn't be anybody on that mountainside. You know, they're in, uh, you know, they're in a pretty remote area. It's extremely dark. 
Yeah. If you've ever been, you know, if you've ever been out in the in the wilderness away from the city, it gets really, really dark out there. So the only light source he has is a lantern that's lit back at the campsite. Um, he's trying to use his flashlight to see what's going on. Um, and he's still hearing this voice, these voices, now voices, right? So he decides he should make contact with these people, let them know that he's there, um, you know, advising, you know, letting these people know they're on a military base and they need to identify themselves. Um, he had a rifle with him, but they hadn't issued bullets for the training exercise, but he tries several times over half an hour to contact whatever's making this sound, whatever's making this chatter. Um, and he finally, he's like, you know, he, he gets fed up with it, puts a bayonet on his rifle, and he's going to go down there and root out the troublemakers. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, I mean, guys is a, you know, is a trained soldier. This is what he does, right? So he goes down. Um, and even with, you know, having affixed the bayonet and, you know, making a more aggressive uh posture the speakers you know just won't come forward and eventually the voices stop and you know i mean there's really no explanation for why anybody would be on the side of a mountain on a military base yeah when it's you know fahrenheit 22 below zero out and the wind is blowing yeah now i know that you know because you live in in the the you know the western new york uh you well, know not central area central central is you know yeah. you know how cold the wind gets. Oh, yeah. Cold. You know, it rips right through you. You know, you would not want to be out on that mountainside in that weather unless you absolutely had to. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, his guard tour ends. Uh, he wakes his replacement up. And, you know, of course, here we got the ridicule factor again. He doesn't say anything because he didn't want anybody to think he's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, so what the hell did he encounter on the side of that mountain? Yeah. Yeah. If you're, you know, hardcore skeptical, well, well, there were some people up there. Right. Well, I, you know, I find that really hard to believe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you wanted to prank somebody, you know, the last people on earth you would want to prank, prank is a group of special operations <laughs> yes. soldiers out on a mountainside, right? Because you might just get your butt shot, you know, depending on whether they're, you know, whether they're authorized for deadly force or not, right? But I wouldn't take that chance. And I wouldn't want to be out on a pitch dark mountainside when it's 22 below zero outside, you know, without any lights, you know, trying to, to, to spook some soldiers. That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, even if you were carrying night vision gear and stuff and you were well equipped, why would you want to harass these particular people yeah. of all yeah. people? Yeah. You know, if you were going to harass somebody, you, you know, I, I would think you would go out and, you know, mess with the local backpackers or something, right? You'd probably get more of a rise out of them. And there's a lot less chance of somebody shooting you, you know, and, up here. And yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, and the thing is, if you, if you took this experience, and you put it in a house. Now it's a ghost story. Yeah. Now you have the wilderness poltergeist, right? Yeah. Um, exactly. And, and so now it's a ghost story, you know, and the, the other thing is why Japanese? <laughs> Yeah. You know, if you were going to prank somebody on a mountainside in Canada, <laughs> you could do English or you could do French. I believe this particular guy was a French speaker because, yeah, if I recall, his record, report had to be translated from the French, right? Yeah. You know, pig Latin. What? Why Japanese? You know, of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of any language that you could be out on a mountainside in 22 below zero weather talking about, talking, speaking, why Japanese? Of course, it, at the it same just, time, his description is just that it, it, it sounded Japanese to him. It sounded Japanese, yeah. Which doesn't mean it yeah, was in Japanese. I mean, it just could have had the cadence that is similar to Japanese. Yeah, yeah. you get that. You know, and again, you know, you hark back to the Sierra sounds and the samurai chatter that, right. that they recorded then. It sounds, you know, I mean, I've heard that recording. It does sound a lot like spoken Japanese from a distance. Yeah. Where yeah. you just can't make out the words, right? Yep. So... Who knows? But yeah, I mean, I loved his story because of the witness, first of all. You know, it's like this guy is a, you know, very, this is a no nonsense individual who lives in the real world, you know, and deals with real world threats all the time. Yeah. You know, he has absolutely no reason whatsoever to make up a story about Sasquatch. Right. Why would you do that? You know, especially since it could, could be injurious to his career if people found out who he was, right? Um, so, you know, I, I, again, you know, you get the skeptics who are like, oh, well, you know, people on the mountainside or, you know, he's just making this crap up or he's delusional or whatever. Yeah. Know? Well, skeptic, like, skeptics are usually the ones who are delusional with half of their explanations. 
Well, yeah. I mean, they're not actually skeptics because if you look at the, the right. definition for a skeptic, yeah. it means somebody who approaches a problem with an open mind. They yep. don't have an opinion about it one way or the other. Uh, I call I call the kind of people that we're talking about skeptibunkers. Yeah. Because um, their their whole purpose in life is to to maintain their scientific materialist paradigm yep. at the expense of anything else, and they will go to fantastic lengths to do that. Um, sometimes, you know, their, their quote unquote explanations make so little sense. It's just ludicrous, but yeah, absolutely. That's, that's another story. And that's, together. that's the thing. They'll, they'll present something that is absolutely ludicrous as if that's better than someone saying they saw Bigfoot, you know, like that's yeah. more acceptable to them, even if it's ridiculous on, on point. It's like, they're, they're just, yeah, the logic's yeah. not there. Uh, you t- you talk in here uh, about a guy who went to take a- who had a camera with him and never took the picture of Bigfoot, mm-hmm. and uh, that happens a lot. And Does. people are always like, "Oh, they're lying because they could have taken a picture." But I can tell you from experience, when you have these experiences, I've had cameras with me occasionally, and I never think, "Oh, I should pull out my camera." Yeah, I should take a picture of this. Yeah, it's like yes, it is true that you know, almost everybody now has a camera with them all the time because so many people are carrying cell phones. But stop and think about this for a minute. If you encounter, and we'll use Sasquatch as an example, but again, we could be talking about any of these different phenomena. Yeah. You know, you could be talking about dogmen, you could be talking about ghosts, you could be talking about UFOs, any of that stuff, right? If we encounter these things, we have a couple of things going on. First of all, usually when we run across one of these things, it's a sudden occurrence. So you get the startle effect right off the bat, right? Something startles you. you know, you're, you're, and then you very quickly process the fact that it's not something familiar to you. Right. Yeah. You know, and that in and of itself is enough to freeze most people for a period of time. Yep. And, and, yeah. and, and then lot- you add in, yeah, you know, then you add in this whole, whole idea that, you know, oh, well, you know, if I had seen this, I would have reached into my, my bag and grabbed my phone and taken a picture. It's like two things here. A, you have no idea how you would behave in that particular circumstance because you've never been there. Yeah. It's like the people who say, oh, you know, who are, who like to do the, the Monday morning quarterbacking for, you know, the, you know, I don't want to get into controversial subjects, but, you know, who like to say, well, I would have handled something in the, Thus in such a way. You're right, right. Without yeah. realizing everything that goes into it. Uh, street fights are a good example. Okay. So, you know, you see, uh, you know, video of people who get into it and, and you always have some guys like, well, I would have done, da, 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 da. it's like, nah, you know, unless you can tell me that you've been in these situations repeatedly and you've managed to come out of them, uh, you know, whole and you use this particular strategy to do that, I'm going to call BS on you um, because you don't really know no. how you're going to behave uh, when you come under stress like that. Same thing with, you know, if you see a, a Sasquatch, right? You don't know how you're going to behave when you come under that stress. Yeah. And then yeah. you have the whole ridicule factor to worry about. It's like, oh, well, even if I take a picture of this thing, people are going to say, oh, well, it's a uh, Photoshop, right? Um, you know, it's like nowadays you can't quote unquote prove that you saw something by taking a picture. No, of it. no, absolutely not. Yeah, Because those same skeptics who are complaining to you about, oh, well, you didn't get a picture of it. You must be lying are the same skeptics that will say, oh, well, you know, look at this picture. It's obviously fake. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, know, you can't win. Look at this video. It's obviously fake. It's a guy in a monkey suit. It's a bear. It's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. you can't <laughs> win. I, that, that's why you just don't even bother with the skeptics. Like, I do not care what skeptics have to say about this stuff. Like, if, I've, had, I've had people I know who are skeptical about this stuff say things like, well, you would have to prove it to me. And I'm always like, I don't have to prove to you anything. Believe what you want. Yeah, yeah. You're perfectly, uh, you know, I'm perfectly fine with you believing whatever you want to believe. Yeah. You know, my experience. I mean, if you is- want to believe that the universe is this inert, is this inert mass of matter and that, you know, People extinguish as soon as their, uh, you know, their heart stop beating. Then, you know, okay, fine, yeah. whatever. <laughs> yep. I don't happen to believe that, but you know, your truth is your truth, and have fun with that. Right. Exactly. You know, you have to live with the consequences of your thinking. You know, so uh, you know, and, and we all have different consequences to the way we think about things. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just uh, the the whole camera thing has always bugged me because I I, I know from having been in high stress situations doing security work and stuff like that, that 
you know, it's fine to say that you would do X, Y, and Z in this or that situation, but unless you've actually been in that situation, I don't know. Yeah. yeah you, you really, really don't. don't know what's going to happen. Nope. Um, and the other thing you point out is even when people pull, pull up a camera, you know, and they get that blurry picture, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's hard to take a clear picture when you're shaking. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you study, you know, I mean, and I come back to police officers and stuff a lot because, like I said, I was in the security business for quite a while when I was younger and uh, I had a bunch of friends that were cops. And, and you know, so I, I was, I've always been interested in, in uh, law enforcement and high stress situations and that kind of thing. Um, you, you know, if you study uh, firefight reports, you know, where police officers have had to draw their weapons and shoot, um, <laughs> It's ridiculous how few of those bullets actually hit what they're intended to hit. Right. right. Because get somebody who, uh, you know, I mean, everybody thinks, oh, well, police officers are trained to use weapons and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, they get some training in the academy and they have to prove that they can still shoot a little bit about once a year. They really are not spending as much time on the range as they, they could to be really effective with a firearm. Right. And so as a result... <laughs> You know, you have, when, when the time comes that they actually have to use that weapon, chances are, unless the person's standing right next to them, um, there's going to be more misses than hits um, because of that precise thing. You know, you're, you're charged with adrenaline. You're, you're, you're really actually in a life and death situation. And, you know, it, it's going to affect your aim and your, your, your hands are going to shake. So if you translate that to the person who just ran into an eight foot tall, 800 pound bipedal ape like creature, you know, especially yeah. if they're at close range, I guarantee you, I don't care who you are or how badass you think you are. You know, this is going to scare you. <laughs> yep. You know, and you're going to shake and getting a good picture, getting a good video, any of that kind of stuff is going to be really, really difficult. It absolutely. You know? And even if you're farther away, then and you have the problem of trying to photograph over a distance. Yeah. So. And the other thing is most of these encounters are over very quickly. Mm -hmm. They're very distinct. I mean, they may feel like they took a while, but when people really think about it, they're like, I don't know, maybe it was only. 10 or 20 seconds. Yeah. It's not yeah, like the, the animal ran, the, the animal ran across the road in front of you. Right. So I mean, there <laughs> That's are the classic Sasquatch sighting, right? And there, there are the occasional extended experiences where you, you have someone who saw something in it and they got to observe it over time. But yeah, most of the time they're quick. And, and it, that goes for all aspects of the paranormal. These things oh, yeah. are blips. Yeah. It's not like, um, you know, Sasquatch walks out into the middle of the clearing and poses for you. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, probably the most common Sasquatch sighting happens on a road, either as the, the creature is crossing the road or as the creature is walking along the side of the road. Yeah. And, you know, this person is driving along. They're usually on a highway. They're going, you know, 60 or 70 miles an hour. And they see this thing and it's like, oh, wow. Oh, and then by the time they come back, it's gone. If yep. they even have the guts to come back, a lot of them are just like, nope, done. <laughs> I'm just going to keep driving here. <laughs> yep. Um, thing was too big for me to argue with. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and if you, you put yourself in the, the place of that woman walking through and seeing the garter snakes and stuff and, and feeling a little unnerved to begin with, and then seeing this thing rise up from pooping in the river or whatever. Yeah. That's, that's unnerving. And then hearing it make noises and then seeing another one coming, you feel like prey. Yeah. You know, you I mean. Very even if, easily would you feel like prey. Even if I those mean, were just bears coming at you, you'd feel like prey because it feels like you're being well, surrounded, yeah. you know. But to have something even bigger than a bear that's an unknown doing that, that's terrifying. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I would. Uh, I'm sure that I would certainly consider turning and fleeing at some point too. <laughs> you know, even though you know, I, I know that running away from a predator is a bad idea because it can revoke, you know, invoke a, a, an aggressive response. Right. Uh, at some point, you know, the mind snaps and you just got to get out of there. You know, um, and that's that's what happened with her at some point apparently because she just turns and runs about 200 meters and then she you know then she loses it. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I can't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> no, not in the slightest. That, that that was a scary scary incident. Let's take a quick break and we'll come back and talk some more about this. Okay. Quick mid show break here, and uh, I'm going to give you some contact info as well as a podcast recommendation. So contact info, 
If you have a story you want to share with us for a listener's story show, or you want to come on and talk about stuff that's happened to you, stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com is the email. General contact is just contact at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And uh, if you want to mail me, physically mail me something, it's P.O. Box 444, Ovid, New York, 14521. If you want to become a patron or you want to check out any of our social media, Discord, any of that stuff, it's all at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And to become a patron, it's only $3 a month. You get the uh, show a week early. And you get extra content on almost every show and some special stuff as well throughout the month, usually. All right, as far as recommendations, I'm going to go with the SCP archives. Um, I'm only now starting to really get into this. It's been going for a while. Uh, One of the Brothers of the Serpent, I can't remember which one, highly recommended it. And I started listening to it. And I was kind of like, I don't know. It's okay. I don't like anthology type of stuff stuff as much as... Uh, stories with arcs to them, but some of these stories from uh, some of these these entries from the SCP archives are absolutely fantastic. Some of them are terrible. There's, there's been a handful I've literally skipped because they were so bad or just so goofy. But um, yeah, it's it's a very Lovecraftian sort of uh, concept of a group that has to uh, collect and protect the world from different anomalies. And these anomalies can be really damn creative. Um, I'm really impressed with some of these stories. They're written by a whole bunch of different people, and they all kind of have the same same idea to them. Uh, the early ones, like I said, it took me a little bit to warm up to, but after I've now I'm now in the second season, and I'm really loving it. So aside from a few few episodes that I thought were like, eh, most of them have been really good, and they just keep getting better. So yeah, S C P archives is the name of the show all right and now back to where did the road go with travis watson i am here with travis watson we're talking about his uh latest book sasquatch canada and let's get to another one of these cases this one from the bfro um this was a testimony of a forestry worker oh okay uh find him real quick so you know i i in the book i have um testimony from, you know, we just talk about somebody who was a special forces, armed forces person. Um, I have testimony from people who are police officers. Um, I found this case particularly compelling because uh, this individual was a forestry worker. That's That was their whole job. Their whole job was to go into the forest and take, you know, measurements of things and determine the health of the forest and so forth. So as he says, he was obtaining information to determine the health of the forest in a plot about 700 meters off of a road where they had parked. Now, this happened up in, um, this is in Ontario as well, up about uh, 65 kilometers from Matheson, Ontario, for people who are, you know, map map junkies. Um, So, again, like I said, this individual is an individual who works determining the health of forests. He's out with his partner, um, and they're measuring trees in a plot that they were working in. Um, they were trying to determine the age of the trees uh, by, by taking these measurements. Um, and they heard a sound. And uh, what he says is that it sounded like an old rotten log being ripped apart uh, just meters from where they were working. Now, this is bear country again. Uh, so the, the logical conclusion for them is that it was a bear that was attempting to uh, you know, tear open a you know, rotten trunk trying to get to grubs or something like that. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, you know, they're thinking bear, um, the, the witness went and retrieved a can of bear, stri- bear spray and, and some tools that he needed from his vest that was hanging, uh, nearby. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when he got back, his partner's like, I don't know what's going on. This thing is circling us, uh, which is not typical bear behavior. Usually bears, particularly black bears, if they determine there's a human in the area, will beat feet in the opposite direction. But whatever this thing was, it was circling them. It was going round and round, uh, which is not typical bear behavior, like I said. Um, they could hear the footsteps, and um, you know, they just kind of shrugged it off and figured the bear was avoiding them, which, again, that would be what a bear normally would do. Mm-hmm. Um, they continued doing their work. Um, they were taking some soil samples and, and doing some other, uh, uh, other measurements. When all of a sudden a, a branch comes arching out or out of the air and, and lands right next to where one of the witnesses was standing. So 
it was his his partner jumps to his feet and pronounces the whole incident effing weird. <laughs> <laughs> and then the two of them discuss whether you know there were any other uh, any other forestry workers in the area because they thought ah well maybe it's it's some of our buddies playing a prank on us right right, right. which again you know perfectly logical thing to do you know so you know nothing that that they felt was too out of the ordinary uh, you know it was either a bear or you know one of their buddies was having them on right another stick landed close to them yeah. um and then the uh the witness you know after the other stick lands decides that he's had enough he starts walking in the direction from which the stick came uh and that's when he spotted something in the woods uh and i'm going to quote here because i, I kind of like his description this is I'm standing absolutely still thinking to myself, who would place an eight foot tall haystack here in the middle of nowhere? (laughs) It was a precarious looking haystack. Then I realized it's not a haystack. (laughs) I remember thinking to look away before you scare it or it moves. My heart and breathing lost rhythm and shock prevented me from moving normally. I caught my breath painfully enough so I could walk back to my partner. So, you know, at first, and, and we see this a lot with, not a lot, but uh, we see this sometimes with Sasquatch site. I, I, there's another uh, uh, incident in the book where an EMT in an oil field is driving along a, a path getting out of the, the, uh, the oil field before um, winter sets in or, yeah. yeah, before winter sets in. And uh, mistakes a Sasquatch for a, a tree trunk um, out, in the, out in the middle of a field until it stands up. Uh, I've also heard them. Yeah, you know, I've I've seen other witnesses where they talk about it. Well, it looked like a big haystack sitting in the middle of the field, and then it stood up. Yeah. Uh, so the same sort of thing happens here. He's like, he goes back, and his partner's like, "So what was it?" He's like, uh, "I don't know, nothing. Just finish up and let's get the you know what out of here." <laughs> So he never told his partner what he saw. You know, again, there's that whole ridicule thing. When a BFRO investigator, you know, talked to him, because uh, he, he put this up on the BFRO website, um, he described this being as being somewhere between eight, uh, six and eight feet tall, estimated that it was probably 600 pounds, broad shoulders, square look to it, long flowing hair that was light brown or yellowish color. So this one was blonde, uh, which gives you the whole haystack thing, right? Yeah. So the creature's arms were very long and held still at its sides. I mean, it held perfectly still for a period of time. Um, he didn't notice any sound. He didn't notice any odor. Uh, but the thing that's notable about this is that after this event, this witness was subject to anxiety attacks for a period of time afterwards mm. so he, he basically had ptsd from seeing this thing yeah yeah now i just i just can't accept that an individual who spends that much time in the forest and is familiar with bears and other wildlife would come across something a bear that scared him so badly that he that he got anxiety attacks from it right i, I just right. i don't accept that you know if it's an identifiable creature i mean sure it could have scared him he walked up on it suddenly whatever but it would be something that was known to him. This creature was obviously not something that was familiar to him. Right. At all. And, and it and should so, have been. Anything he found out there should have been yeah, familiar to him. Yeah, anything he found out there should have been something he knew about because he spends tons of time out there. Yeah. Um, so, again, we see that encounters with these creatures have a profound effect on the people that see them. Yeah. Now, I won't say all witnesses have, no. you know, have this kind of reaction to things. I mean, they don't all end up having PTSD or whatever, but a lot of them, you see one of two reactions. You see the people who say, I'm never going in the woods ever again. <laughs> right. Period. Right. And then you have the people who turn around and spend all their time in the woods <laughs> looking right. for Sasquatch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they had that one experience and they want to do it again. Yep. (laughs) Like they like the roller coasters. They want to do it again. (laughs) But, you know, I mean, I just in this particular case, um, you know, this sighting profoundly affected this witness. And we cannot, we cannot ignore that kind of effect on people. You know, just as basic, you know, empathetic, sensitive, compassionate human beings listening to a story, we can't ignore that kind of reaction to, you know, to a sighting. Yeah. Yeah. Even if he did see a bear and mistook it for a Sasquatch, you still can't ignore that, that effect. You know, the same way that you can't ignore the the trauma of abduction experiencers. Right. We don't know what the hell's going on with them, but something's happening to them. You know, and we have to 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 be willing to to you know 
put our theories aside and just listen to the witness and say, okay, that's your experience. Yep. Yeah. You know? And that's not so hard. <laughs> it really isn't. But, but, but the way that, that, you know, investigating gets done nowadays, a lot of times, you know, it's like you have investigators who are trying to cram your experience into their box. Yep. Yep. Exactly. You know, do away with the boxes, people. This is Fortiana. It's never going to make sense. <laughs> exactly. Especially if you're squeezing it into a box. I mean, yeah. I feel like most of this the more stuff. The you try to squeeze it into a box, you know, the, 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 the less likely it is to fit. I, I feel like with a lot of this stuff, if those boxes worked, we would understand this phenomena by now. The fact that yeah. after, you know, how many years from, from or all these different phenomena, we're no further along than we were before suggests to me the boxes are wrong. Yeah. We're asking the wrong questions or yeah. making the wrong assumptions. Well, it's like, uh, for instance, I think it was John Keel. I could be misspeaking here, but I think it was Keel who said, you know, one of the things that ought to be on your questionnaire when you go out to investigate anything is, have you had any other unusual incidents? Right. Yeah. You know, because it's like what you were talking about earlier. It's like, the, the person who is reporting a Sasquatch and talking to a Sasquatch investigator is going to tell you a Sasquatch story. But he may not tell you about the weird lights in the forest yeah, yeah. or, you know, the cattle mutilations down the road <laughs> or the UFO that he saw the other day or, you know, any of those kinds of things. Because he doesn't think you're interested in that. Yeah, well, well, that like, and the, you also have that ridicule factor. And you have the ridicule factor, yes. Like, oh, if if I if I tell people that I saw Bigfoot and then this other weird thing happened, they're going to think I'm lying. Yeah, exactly. Because you know, I mean, unfortunately, that's probably not far off the mark. No, it's because not. Because you have investigators that will, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not going to point fingers at anybody, but there are investigators out there who if. You tell them you saw a Sasquatch, and then you turn around and say, well, there were these weird lights in the forest. They'll throw your report out. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to hear it. And, and again, think about how much data we've probably, that we probably don't have either because it wasn't reported or was only partially reported because of ridicule, because of these boxes, because, you know, we might have a much yeah. better grasp on this stuff if we were getting the full story. Yeah. I mean, the thing that pops to my mind in Sasquatch research is the whole Ape Canyon thing. You know, now in in the traditional Sasquatch lore, and, and I'm going off the reservation here because this is not in the book. Right. But, you know, you know, if you follow the traditional Sasquatch lore, you have these guys and they go into this canyon in know, Washington or someplace like that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're prospecting and they're doing their thing, and they have an encounter with Sasquatch and. It, you know, it, it turns hostile and they end up shooting something and, you know, they end up, uh, you know, their cabin gets pelted with stones. You know, it's all about, you know, these hostile Sasquatch trying to run these guys out of their territory, right? And then you read, you know, where the footprints end and you find out about all the weird spiritualist stuff that happened before that stuff. Yep. <laughs> And it's like, okay, you know, if you knew the whole picture, then why hasn't that been reported? Yes. It hasn't been reported because it doesn't fit in the box. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So anyway. All right. <laughs> let's get to another case here. This one is, well, this one comes from Monster Quest and Sasquatch Chronicles. Oh, yeah. yeah. But Doug. Yeah, Hi no. Hi Hi I think he pronounces it high check. High check. Okay. But, but uh, it's spelled H-A-J-I-C-E-K. So for those of you who know better, you can you can write in and tell us what the pronunciation <laughs> is. But it seems like I've heard him called high check. Um, now, this is a really interesting case because, not so much because of what they saw or any of that kind of stuff, but because of some, some weirdness that happened in this case. Um, you know, it's a, it is a classic, what the BFRO calls a class B encounter, where uh, there are phenomena that are attached to Sasquatch that happen while they're there uh, at this this site, but uh, they never actually see a Sasquatch. Right. Now, the basic story is this. Okay. Uh, the television show Monster Quest, uh, the show's producer is this Doug Highcheck guy. Um, he he produced Monster Quest, and, uh, and I derived some of this information from Sasquatch Chronicles interview with him and some of the background information from one of Preston Dennett's books. Um, but, you know, again, High Check's one of these people who, who grew up in the woods, knows something about nature, has done nature documentaries and so forth, had a uh, had a, a footprint encounter early in his career that uh, kind of got him obsessed with the whole Sasquatch thing. 
Um, so when he was doing Monster Quest, um, they decided that they were going to go to a place called Snellgrove Lake. Again, this is in Ontario, and we're talking complete wilderness area. This place is so remote that the only way you can get in and out or out of there is on a, on a float plane. They, they fly you in, land on the lake, taxi you up to a dock, uh, and you go uh, float your stuff, and there's a cabin there, and that's it. <laughs> there's nobody yeah. else around, right? You know, there's probably nobody for 25 miles in any direction. Um, so Monster Quest makes two of these uh, two of these episodes. They call them Sasquatch Attacks and Sasquatch Attacks Two, which is a little melodramatic, but right. uh, you know it's TV. Yep. You know, they're trying to be entertaining. Um, they're very excited about the possibility of DNA evidence and all this stuff. And you know, there there's you can read about it in the book. There's tons of stuff that happens during the course of this uh, uh, during the course of this episode. One of the interesting things is that before they got there, uh, this cabin was ransacked by something. And they bought in their resident expert on bears, Dr. Lynn Rogers, um, who takes a look at the video of the cabin that was taken for insurance purposes. And he was pretty much of the opinion it wasn't done by a bear uh, because there are no cloth or teeth, claw or teeth marks in, in the cabin. Yeah, uh, It looks like whatever did the damage had hands. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so you know, either uh, Sasquatch ransacked the cabin, or um, you know, there were some rogue people run, running around doing something they shouldn't have been doing. Right. Uh, but again, I stress this is an extremely remote area of Canada. There's not a town anywhere close to this. It's not like you're going to get teenagers who are out riding around on their dirt bikes and decide they're going to get into this cabin. It's just not going to happen. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, the other thing that, that Rogers points out is that, you know, if it had been a bear, uh, normal, normally, uh, refrigerators get mauled in, in, uh, instances where bears get into, um, into cabins because I guess the formaldehyde in the, in the insulation smells like formic acid, which is, which bears associate with ants. Mm. Um, again, the refrigerator was tipped over if I recall, um, but there were no claw or tooth marks on this. They recovered hair, and there's the whole thing about doing morphological exams, and they can't identify that, and all that sort of thing. There's also, uh, you know, the uh, owner of the cabin had put out a basically a bear trap, a, as a uh, or a bear deterrent thing, is a, a board with a bunch of screws driven through it, so that if the bear steps on it, it will hurt his paws, right? Well, something stepped on it, and during the course of the show, you know, we were, we get the impression that maybe a Sasquatch stepped on this thing because there's blood and hair and all this stuff, and it gets sent in for analysis. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of set to in that first um, that first episode about you know oh the DNA analysis shows that this is you know uh, something that's almost identical to human being, but. Uh, you, know, you get into the second episode and the the, the conclusions become much less um, set in stone. So, you know, you had a, a all-star cast of people there. You know, you had High Check and his crew. Jeff Meldrum was there. There's, uh, I think, uh, if I recall, Esteban Sarmiento, a part primatologist, was there. Uh, was a wildlife biologist named Kurt Nell. There's a whole bunch of scientific type people there, right? Um, so, you know, they tried all the standard, you know, Sasquatch calling stuff, doing wood knocks and all that stuff. Nothing. They'd had nothing go on the entire time they were there until the last night of their investigation. Uh, one of the film crew, uh, if you didn't want to go off to the outhouse in the dark, urinated off the front porch. Almost immediately, uh, a rock was thrown from the bush, uh, which narrowly missed the, the crew member. Um, Kurt Nelson, the, the biologist I was talking about earlier, picked a rock up and threw it back into the forest. And a rock sailed up and over the cabin and landed on the roof. Now, the thing that I found really interesting about this is the, the rocks were, were pelting the tin roof of the cabin is that all of the people in this, um, you know, in this episode seem to be having an extreme fear reaction. Um, they were all, you know, all basically ran back in the cabin, pulled the shades down and huddled up like, oh, well, you know, there might be some, there might be a monster out there. Yeah. Now, I don't, I don't know if this was just a television thing or, or what, but it just seemed really odd to me that these people who were so invested in, in actually, uh, you know, discovering Sasquatch, as soon as a sign that something was going on in their neighborhood happened, they all ran in the cabin and hid. Yeah. Um, yeah. Except for one poor cameraman who got left outside. 
uh, who was scanning the tree line with thermal and night vision equipment. And again, classic class B type phenomena, nothing. They saw nothing. So they pack up, they go home, uh, and, uh, and and that seems to be pretty much the end of it. There's a second Sasquatch Attacks uh, episode of Monster Quest where, you know, there's the whole business about debunking the DNA and, you know, and all this other stuff happens. And there's so little going on at the cabin that they actually end up going to, uh, a, you know, a few, like, 100 kilometers or so north to one of the Indian reserves where – there's a, a fresh sighting, you know, and they kind of save the episode by, you know, there's tracks and, and, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and they have, you know, the, the, the lady who, the, uh, the, the native person who saw the native persons who saw this uh, creature, you know, give their testimony and all that stuff. So otherwise I think they would have had trouble making an episode out of it. Yeah. Um, they had loaded the, the cabin for bear with infrared cameras and all this stuff outside and absolutely nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. But the interesting thing about the, the High Check Snell Grove Lake thing is that High Check had, uh, had, had heard about this place um, and had been camping there on several occasions beforehand and had an experience that, you know, is, is completely unexplainable. <laughs> um, he and a group of people had come up to do some hunting and fishing and stuff, and they they were spending time at the cabin. Um, they had, uh, you know, and they seemed to be aware that there were there was something in the area. You know, they'd done some wood knocks and some stuff during the course of the night. Um, they'd been sitting out on the the, uh, the the porch and and shooting the breeze, and you know, they do the occasional wood knock and and so forth. Eventually, most of the people in the party decided that they were going to go to bed. Um, they settled down for the evening. Uh, High check stayed up and uh, was reading. And eventually, he got to the point where he was ready to, to sack out too. Uh, he goes into the kitchen and turns the light on and all hell breaks loose. Um, he says that there's sticks and stones hitting the top of the cabin. And uh, it eventually, it felt like something was grabbing the side of the cabin and shaking it. Now, yeah. that's scary enough by itself, mm -hmm. right? The really weird part about this is that all of the people in the cabin who were there and were sleeping slept through the whole thing. Yeah. Nobody woke up, you know, despite this intense disturbance going on and this noise and, and confusion and, you know, shaking cabin and, you know, rocks hitting, this, you know, all of this stuff. Everybody in the cabin slept through this entire thing. It was like high check was in this little null zone, yeah. You know, that was had all this activity yeah. going on, and everybody else was, you know, in another reality basically. Um, so I, I found that part of the the narrative probably more fun than the whole class B thing. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's... and I I was totally unaware of that until I actually listened to uh, to his interview, um, and you know, and he talks about that in the interview. Um, it's just it's just a really incredible story, but again, it's one that most people aren't going to hear about because it doesn't fit the box. Yeah, you know, it's not you know the 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 hairy ape doesn't cause you know mystical phenomena to happen around people. <laughs> it's all very normal. It's probably just infrasound, right? Yes, exactly. So. Well, let's we have time, but, I think, to squeeze one more in. Let's talk about okay. the hy hybrids. Oh, okay, yeah. Which so, ironically involves a picture. Which ironically involves a picture. This is one of the few, uh, and for those of you who uh, are interested in photographic evidence, I, I talk about photographic evidence at the beginning of the book. Um, you know, I'm agnostic about photos. Yeah. Um, I don't know enough about photo manipulation and that kind of thing to really look at a, a picture or, you know, put it into software or any of that kind of stuff and say, oh, well, this was a fake or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I, I, one of the things that I didn't do in the book was include, you know, like photos of things, except for this, this one thing, um, it, or, or, well, I talk about the, the photo in this, in this particular case, because it's on the Sasquatch Canada website. If you're interested in it, uh, it's the testimony of Mr. and Mrs. D. Hybert, H E I B E R T. Um, and they have what appears to be, uh, you know, again, I'm not an expert in photographic manipulation or any of that stuff, but they have what appears to be a couple of really good shots of a Sasquatch up on a hillside uh, near their cabin um, in, uh, yeah, uh, in the, the Temagami region of Ontario, which, interestingly enough, is a place that uh, 
uh, Survivor Man, Les Stroud, ah. has done a, 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 done one of his survival shows. It was one of his very first Survivor Man shows was in the Temagami region of Ontario. It's an intense, thick boreal forest. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it would be great habitat, Tad, if you were a giant hairy bipedal ape, right? So the Highbirds had a cabin uh, that was up near uh, Lady Evelyn Smooth Water Park in the Temagami region of Ontario. This was in uh, April of 2009, and uh, it was in the afternoon. Uh, Ms. Mrs. Hybert went to open the blinds to the back bedroom uh, of this cabin and spotted this creature up on a hill about 50 or 70 yards away. She calls her husband. Uh, he picks up his, uh, let's see, it was a Canon EOS Digital Rebel XT uh, with a 300 millimeter lens. For those of you who know something camera. about photography. Yeah, that's a I, great I camera. No, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, so he picks up his camera um, and he moves out to the to the back of the cabin uh, to try to get a picture of this thing. Uh, as he as he moves out of the thing, he thinks that this creature actually sees him and it freezes. So here's one of the you know even in a situation where somebody actually got what appears to be a good picture, uh, he had trouble getting his camera ready to shoot. <laughs> We see this happen with a Loch Ness monster too. You know, yeah. so people go to, sh to take a camera and uh, take a picture, and, and things just go to hell in a handbasket, and they can't get a picture, or they get one and it's all foggy and stuff. Um, in this case, um, for some reason, I guess he had to delete photos from his SD card so he never <laughs> to take pictures right. of the animal. I guess he'd been wandering around snap pictures or whatever. Which I can totally relate to. I have a, a, a stepson who's a, a big time a photo buff, or used to be. I don't know if he has much time for picture taking now. Uh, but yeah, when we went to the Grand Canyon, uh, he was, you know, in, in the throes of his photographic frenzy, and uh, we had to spend a lot of time downloading pictures to the computer so that he'd continue to have room. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Anyway, he had to download pictures from his uh, SD card or delete them from his SD card. Um, he moved quickly enough to get two photos of the creature and then one a little later. They were both taken from a position looking up the hill uh, from the top of the cabin's propane tank. He says that the thing stood perfectly still for what seemed like five minutes. Um, and here's another one of those weird Sasquatch things. I turned my head for a split second and it was gone. Yeah. Now... We hear this over and over and over again in Sasquatch lore. Yeah, there are stories in the book, and uh, there's a whole section in the book that's called Strange Things. And there's one story from Whitehorse, which is up in Northwest Territories, where a native man is driving along uh, a road, and uh, he sees a Sasquatch. And as he's watching this creature, it becomes translucent and then fades from sight. It just, it, it literally disappears in front of his eyes. Yeah. More often, what we see is this situation where somebody, you know, they're distracted, they take their eyes off of it for a minute, uh, whatever, and the creature's gone. Now, you know, the, the flesh and blood researchers would have us believe that these guys are, are you know, like the forest ninjas. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, they, they, <laughs> they have this extreme ability to camouflage. And if you take your eyes off of them, they're going to disappear in front. 500 pound ninjas. <sighs> yeah. I mean, an eight foot tall you know, five, six, maybe 800 pound ninja. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, cause the other thing that, that you hear over and over again is how fast these things move. Um, so, you know, I'm willing to, to give it the benefit of the doubt and say, yeah, some of these circumstances are things where people got distracted or whatever. They looked away and, and the creature, you know, blended into the forest. Um, but there are some stories where people are looking right at the thing when it disappears. So, you know, yeah. you can't be sure that, you know, Mr. Hybert didn't take his eyes off the Sasquatch and it just stepped in between and disappeared. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not completely convinced one way or the other. Um, he describes this Sasquatch as being 10 feet tall and, and very massive. He, he pegged it as being roughly twice his size. So yeah. um, this, this is, you know, something that big going to have. I, you know, I, I really, I don't get the whole insistence that, you know, these guys are the ninjas of the forest because they're so freaking big. It's like, you know, how do they do that? You know, even a bear, you know, which is accustomed to living in the forest all the time, doesn't just disappear. Yeah. You know, it may walk off into the brush, but it doesn't just disappear. So, you know, I, I mean, I think you have a combination of things happening in these, these cases where this happens. You have 
uh, you may have something more paranormal going on. Uh, there's the possibility uh, that's been raised by several researchers that these guys are using infrasound on people to kind of freeze their brains while they disappear, which, you know, I mean, okay, let's give Sasquatch superpowers, why don't we? <laughs> uh, yeah, or, you know, it may be that there are certain circumstances where somebody looked away for longer than they thought they had and it just, you know, walked off into the woods. Uh, you know, again, I'm a both and thinker. I'm willing to believe just about anything. Uh, well, we can't prove anything, so you can't rule and, anything and out. You can't prove it. The thing that always bugs me about this, though, is that almost invariably what you'll do, what you'll hear is, I was watching this thing and then I looked away and then it was gone. So I went to where I saw it, but there was no trace of it there. Yeah. Now, I realize that in certain uh, strata, it's really difficult to get tracks. Uh, you know, I've, I'm not a, a tracker, but I've actually, when I was in search and rescue, did a man tracking class. So I understand a little bit about track traps and stuff like that. I know it's it, it can be hard to get tracks for some some uh, in some uh, strata. <sighs> but, I mean, when you're talking about something that big... It should be leaving scuff marks or yeah, yeah. you know impressions or something to let you know that it was standing wherever it was that you thought it was standing. Um, and a lot of times, you you know, people go up there. Ah, I didn't find anything. There wasn't anything there. Um, you know, or they'll find one footprint. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so the the hybrids decided that they were going to report this to the Ministry of Natural Resources and, and the provincial police, and of course, they got laughed at. But the interesting sub note or uh, uh, post postscript to this is that um, even though the uh, MNR people and the provincial police laughed them off, uh, a game warden and several biologists from the MNR, the Ministry of Natural Resources, appeared later and quote attended the cabin, taking photos and investigating. And these guys stayed even after the hybrids left the cabin. <laughs> So this incident shook Mrs. Hybrid up enough to where they sold the cabin. They said, nope, nope, not doing that anymore. Yeah. No more Sasquatches for us. <laughs> but they did talk about how that sighting was the culmination. And, and this is one of those rare instances where all the stuff gets reported, right? The sighting was a culmination of several really weird instances uh, that happened around the cabin. They had a noise that sounded like a seismic thumper truck in the woods, uh, along with tree breaks in 2004. They had blue and black helicopters flying low and circling the area in 2006, apparently with no markings. Um, and then the road to the cabin was blocked by a large boulder in 2007. So you had kind of the uh, mixture of Class B and government conspiracy stuff happening in the yeah. area. Um, that whole business with the MNR showing up and and basically staking out the cabin makes me wonder if the you know the Canadian government does know a little bit more about this stuff than they're they're letting on. Um, you know, at least as far as where these creatures are appearing and you know they're trying to gather information too. It's it's kind of like the UFO thing. I don't think the government actually has any idea what's going on yeah, with UFOs yeah. or Sasquatch either one. But they know there's something out there and they try, you know, kind of sub Rosa to collect information on it when they can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so that's, that's the, the photo story from Sasquatch. Camp. So we are now out of time, but where can people find you online? Okay. So, uh, as I, I said before, and we'll say again, I'm available on, you know, several of the social major social media things. I don't, don't do TikTok. Sorry, kids. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that anybody would be interested in seeing a video of me sitting around and talking about weird stuff. <laughs> you um, never know. You never know. I, I don't know. I'm fine. I might try it someday, but <laughs> um, I, I have enough irons in the fire right now. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, you can find me. Uh, I have a, a WT Watson author page. <clears throat> Again, I write my books under W.T. Watson. It's kind of my pseudonym. Um, if you want to contact me or, or you know interface with me personally, I'm actually Will Watson on Facebook. Um, and you can find me because I'm the weird Sasquatch guy <laughs> um, or weird whatever guy. It's, yeah. it's like it's pretty easy because I got, you know, uh, book uh, covers pasted all over my um my uh, uh, Facebook Facebook page. Yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at WT Watson two. Um, I'm also on Instagram and this is the weird one. Uh, I was on Instagram before I started writing and this is just a personal thing that I use for posting stuff. Sometimes it's coronary 60 C U 
R-U-N-I-R-6-0, and you get extra points if you can figure out where that comes from in the Tolkien uh, uh, <laughs> world. Um, and I'm not dropping any more hints than that. <laughs> but um, those are the places I can be found. Uh, the, and I'm always happy to hear from people, you know, who've read the books, who, you know, I have people occasionally contact me about sightings, uh, you know, uh, I'm more of a, of a, uh, of an archivist than anything else. But, um, you know, I'm always interested to hear people's stories. Um, and I, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, and the books are available on Amazon. Um, so you can, uh, you can order paperback, you can order Kindle. Um, I think that some of them have gone to wider distribution at this point, but uh, I, I think Sasquatch Canada is still pretty much on Amazon. So. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Will. Oh, absolutely. It's always a pleasure, Soraya. Thanks very much for asking me. I want to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons, and especially those of you pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Chuck Shutters, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Bart Ooms. 36 Dingo, CJ, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Christine, a blue second-gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Guayaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, Chris, Craig Cisternos, Craig Pernmenter, Diane B., MTK, Eric Todd, J, J Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Ole Andre Olar, Patricia W, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Linda. History and Coffee, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Russ Rouse, Sam Sharon, Seed Person One, Stacy Sherwood, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very much. For helping me keep this show going. So we uh, we still have a lot of stuff to talk to Travis about. So we're going to do a whole other part. Um, and eventually I'm going to have him back for some, some roundtables. Because I think that will be interesting. But we're going to do one more part on his Sasquatch uh, Canada book. And we did a Patreon segment with this as well. That will be up later in the week for patrons. If you want to become a patron. It's three bucks a month. We're at therogo.com. It helps us out greatly. And you get a lot of stuff throughout the month for that $3. And I want to thank and welcome some new patrons, Joel Hansen, uh, Linda for upping her pledge, uh, History and Coffee, Denise, and Lawrence Holloway. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, I hope you enjoy the content, and I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>